but I'm a whole lot better today. I had uh, some kind of stomach bug, I guess. I just my stomach was tore up for all week. I'm, you know, I think it's about over, but anyway, I'm I'm a hundred percent better. That's for sure. So thank you for your prayers. Apologize for not having the. Uh, the um, Bible study on Thursday night, but I just wasn't, <laughs> I just couldn't do it. Let's see if I picked up. Oh, I guess it, I ought to say something. I, you know, I guess you notice there's a little bit different format here. <clears throat> it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that my Bible stand wouldn't stand up. But I just thought <clears throat> it would be good for these brethren to set up here with me. They can help feed me scriptures or maybe make comments or, you know, uh, be more more of a part so I just thought we might try to do that I'm trying to here we go um, I want to say something to you um, this morning about um, I want I want to talk on the tar tar topic of harvest if I can and uh, if um, maybe if you'd turn with me to the book of revelations to start with but we're going to look at several scriptures um, in the 14th chapter <clears throat> and uh, I want to start actually in the 13th verse <clears throat> by the way uh, it's good to have Sister Nova Lee and Sister Ada. Uh, what's your last names? Wyrick. Why? Well, I should have knew that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so they're from Shepherd, Texas. And um, Sister Nova Lee, she's, she's well acquainted with Brother Neff. And Ada. She's, uh, that's her first time here, and I'm glad that she come too. Uh, and I think everybody else here is pretty well family. <coughs> uh, I don't think I've left anybody out. And uh, our, our graduates are here today. I think Sister Ada graduated this year, too, didn't you? Or is it you or Sister Nova Lee? Okay. All right, so <clears throat> accomplishments, good accomplishments. I'm very thankful for that. I always uh, want to honor our young people when they accomplish, you know. Uh, it's a great accomplishment to finish education, you know, and... And uh, I've always liked to recognize the little ones when they leave uh, uh, grade school to middle school, middle school to high school, and, and then finally get their diploma. And uh, and then those of you that go into college, you know, I'm not saying that there's not uh, benefits in uh, some of the uh, 
developments that, that take place outside of continuing an education in college, but I think college education is, is a very good thing, and I think it's great <clears throat> when those, those who are able to accomplish, you know, degrees and, and, um, uh, and careers that you know, the world we're living in, I'll tell you, we're living in a, in a crazy world today. And uh, it's real hard to know, you know, how to how to move forward in this world because obviously we we are somewhere down in the end of the Gentile world. Uh, you know, we have to be wise enough in the scriptures to to know. You think that background. Sound like maybe they found it. Anyway, um, so um, so anyway, we know, and that's one of the things I want to mention here about harvest. If, uh, <clears throat> if you go back to the thirteenth verse of Revelations fourteen, I want to mention this verse. Listen to what it says. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I think it's, very, it's a very uh, important note to make of what this scripture is saying that there is a certain time that to die in the Lord and I don't think that death means a natural death I think that death is talking about dying out to sin uh, and then resting from your labors <clears throat> that's what we're all achieving or attempting to achieve is overcoming sin reaching perfection and resting from our labors. That's what perfection is, is when you get to a point that you're no longer doing your own will. Uh, you know, I, I'd almost like to say, just, just clarify that statement right there. I think your will, now when the Bible talks about, you know, like Jesus, when he said, I came to do the will of my Father, I think that that will actually becomes your will as you develop in God and mature. You, you begin to realize that the righteousness of God is the right way to live and behave. And, of course, it is a spiritual. You, you do develop a spiritual mind and a spiritual life of righteousness. And your mind wills to do once you learn the th ways of God, you want, your desire is to do God's will. When I'm saying, <clears throat> you know, not to do your own will, that's the will of the flesh or the Adamic nature that we all develop as we're born in this world. You know, Job said man's, man is just a few days and full of trouble. Well, you can't help but be born in this world and take on the ways of the fallen nature of Adam and and uh, so uh, it takes that new birth uh, of the Holy Ghost to uh, finally develop in the things of God and understanding true righteousness. So this scripture to me is a unique scripture. It's the only scripture I know of in the Bible that actually tells us there's a specific time to die in the Lord from henceforth, it says. In other words, there's, there's a time now from here on, there's a blessing of those that are able to die in the Lord and rest from their, from their labors. Verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud... And upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. 
And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So <clears throat> I, what I'm saying about this scripture, and I'll elaborate on it more later, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start in the Old Testament with, the, with harvest and move forward to finish up with this scripture to show that the harvest here is in the end of the Gentile world. And... There is a specific time for the harvest. Uh, here, he says, I looked and below, behold a white cloud. That cloud is a restored church, which we can elaborate more in giving scriptures to show that a cloud, Jesus coming in the clouds, you all have heard me talk about that. You know, I've used a, I wish I had a cup. Somebody bring me an empty cup. And... I need a cup for an example, one that don't have anything that I'm going to pour out because I'm going to turn it upside down. Um, <clears throat> one that sat on the cloud. See, Jesus is, he, he is, he's, he will be the head of the body of Christ when it's fully restored. We're still trying to make the Lord fully our head. And so, Brother Mike, if you, if you, you couldn't, Warm it up a little bit for me if you want to. Here's this cloud, or the world. Here's the world. People that think Jesus is coming back on cloud level to gather his bride hadn't thought a lot about it. Let's just say, let me get right here on this little seam. Right here is, right here is, is Arkansas. He's coming back to Arkansas, Little Rock, after, as a matter of fact. Y'all all get that? Hey, did you get that? You remember what I told you? All right. So, <clears throat> I love these. I love young people. Anyway, so, uh, if Jesus comes down to cloud level, and if the earth is round like this, and people over here in Shepherd, Texas, if Jesus comes down here, cloud level, now you see how the earth, uh, the, the, the horizon, see the earth horizon is on a curve. In fact, <clears throat> if you're at sea, the sea's level. You can only see seven miles from standing at the end of a boat to where the horizon the sky meets the sea, seven miles. Why? Because the earth is round and the earth's curvature has curved off, and so you can't see any more sea. You just see where the sky meets it because it turns. And that's just seven miles. If you're at, now here we're 200 and, I'm going to say 200 and, I'm a pilot, so I remember that we're something like 236 feet above sea level here in Little Rock, Arkansas. So when you're above the sea level, you'll see a little further than seven miles. But you're not going to see much further. You wouldn't see, you might see 12, 14 miles. Now as a pilot, if you get up high enough, I remember one time I picked up a plane in Tucson, Arizona, and I climbed to 14,000 feet. And... I could see Dallas from El Paso that high in the sky. I could see it's night, so I could see the lights. You know, I had GPS in my plane, so I knew what I was looking at. But so, <clears throat> but what my point is, is if Jesus came down to cloud level here in Shepherd, you'd never see him. You'd never see, you can't see that far. I mean, he'd have to be at least 14,000 feet. And you can't, you can't see that high up, especially if it's a cloudy day. If you come back in clouds, clouds are going to hinder you. My point is, when the Bible talks about Jesus coming back in clouds, it's talking about him coming back in a restored church. 
I've got several scriptures to prove that in the Bible. But I'm just giving you that. Now, <clears throat> that's not my main point today, but I just thought I'd give that to you. And here it said, Look, and behold, a white cloud, and upon that cloud one set like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, which a ruler, rulership of, of gold, the most richest, magnificent uh, metal that there is, or ore that there is in the world, which represents wisdom. It's what it represents in the Bible. The true wisdom of the Word of God. And his hand, in his hand, that's his ministry, a sharp sickle. A sickle <clears throat> used to be what, what you would cut wheat up down with. It had to be done by hand. They'd just, they'd just take a sickle and cut it down. Like now we use, what, it, what, what is it we use now? Combine. Combine. Thank you, Brother Durham. So, and then another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice, said, Thrust in your sickle, reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So there's a harvest time that Jesus is coming back in a second heaven, our restored church, and reaping the earth. And I'll say that's when he makes up his bride because of this 13th verse that blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from henceforth. That's when he's going to make up his bride. There has to be a, there has to be a harvest and a development of what was planted until it comes to a full place where it's ripe and then it's ready to be reaped. Okay, so <clears throat> so let me go back here to let's go to the book of Joshua, the third chapter and the fifteenth verse. <clears throat> we'll start in verse actually, yeah, verse fourteen and fifteen. This is when Joshua led the children of Israel across Jordan into the promised land. And he says, <clears throat> uh, And it will come to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan and, their, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of water, for Jer Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest. I'm just showing you it was a time of harvest when the children of Israel came out of the wilderness into the promised land. When they crossed over Jordan, Jordan had overflowed her banks because it was time of harvest, because of the rains of the latter rain. When the, when the rains came, Jordan overflew, over, over flooded her banks, and that's when they had to go across. That's a picture. If y'all remember listening to the ministers in the body for many years, they talked about the church going into the wilderness, and that we are in the wilderness until the church is restored, which will enter into the promised land, the harvest, the time of harvest. Well, we'll have to cross over, and, and what it's a picture of is, is religion's going to come all come together and join together, and that's going to cause Jordan, a picture of Babylon or, or, or religious systems, to come together and overflow their banks. And there will be a ministry that will lead God's people through that on dry shod ground. You won't get... Even anything on your feet crossing over dry Jordan. When you cross over Jordan, there's not going to be any mud left. It, God's not only going to separate the waters and cause them to divide, He's going to dry the ground. Where you're not going to, you're not going to carry any part of Babylon with you as, as God takes you through this conglomeration of religion that's attacking our world 
This is going to be something, saints. Uh, I think it's amazing that uh, you know the senator of of Michigan is a Muslim, a woman, and I was listening to her make a speech this week, where she clearly said, she said our agenda as Muslims has to be a specific agenda to help this world and it has to be calculated of how we handle ourselves as Muslims because our agenda is to make sure that America becomes a Muslim nation. And that is their agenda. And today, 48% of the population in Detroit, Michigan is Muslim. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you, they're working at it. They're, they're working at it. Of, of changing this American, this America, to a Muslim nation. It's, this is we're living in a, an amazing time, and um, and Mus the Muslim world will play a great part. I don't think it'll take place until the Ten Kings take over, but the Ten Kings, I'll prophesy, will be predominantly Muslim. They'll have the majority vote in the in which I right now I'm looking at the ten kings as not being natural kings but the United Nations. When America goes down in judgment and the ten kings take over, I don't see any other anything intact at this moment that would uh, that would uh, be able to bring some sort of stabilization or at least an attempt of bringing the world's uh, the Bible calls America going down an, a, an earthquake, a shaking, a tremendous shaking. It's never shook like it's going to shake. And I think the United Nations, the, the number 10 in the Bible represents judgment. And that's the only judgment seat in the world that will be left that I know of at this time. It may change before that happens, but right now that's all I can equate it to. But they they will attempt to bring some stability from the shaking of, of America's dominant power, dragon power, if you will, and uh, when it goes down and the ten kings will take over, and of course they're going to agree with the beast for, for one hour, the Bible says, but God's also put it in her mind to hate her and to eat her flesh and destroy her. So it'll be deceitful they're agreeing with the beast but they will eventually take it down and it'll that that's going to bring uh, that's going to bring on the battle of Armageddon in the end which will destroy uh, the it'll it will bring a destruction to the end of the Gentile world of course after that the the Millennium will take over. It's going to take some time for the world to get cleaned up at that time. Anyway, I just wanted you to see here that the overflowing banks of Jordan is at the time of harvest. All right, let me go to the next verse. Uh, uh, let's mention here the book of Ruth. In Ruth, Ruth 2... 23. Naomi, verse, let's start in 22. said, Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with the maiden, his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwell with her mother-in-law. The book of Ruth is a picture of uh, the Gentile church. Uh, it's a picture when, you know, if you remember, there was a great drought in Israel, which is a picture of the church falling away and Elimelech, uh, he had two sons. Um, Malon and Kilion. 
and they were married to Ruth and Orpah. They were, um, see, who were they were Moabites, and so, <clears throat> which was a gen, they were Gentiles. They married Gentiles. That's a picture of the church falling away. The book of Ruth was written over over 2,500 years ago, and it was a picture for the Gentile church to understand that there would be a restored church. There's, there's a type in that, in that sto little story of Ruth. And Ruth, if you remember, that's a picture of the Gentile church. When she was married to uh, McLone, uh, he influenced her in such a way that she believed 100% in what he had convinced her of in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the nation of Israel being the chosen people of God. And if you remember, Elimelech died, McClone died, Kilion died. That's a picture that the ministry, the ministry ceased to exist down through the dark ages for a period of time. When the Reformation started, that was a picture of the early church, Naomi, saying, you know, God, I hear God has blessed the land, and let us I'm going back. I'm going back to Israel. And, of course, you all remember the story. Ruth said, I'm going with you. And she said, no. She said, don't, you, you don't need to go with me. I can't have any more children. I can't provide you another husband. Orpah went back. She was not influenced by Kilion. That's a picture of a false ministry. But uh, McLone had such an influence over Ruth that she was steadfast. I'm going with you. I, your people are going to be my people. Where you die, I'm going to buy die. Your God's going to be my God. And of course, she went back with her, and lo and behold, it was a time of harvest. And one of the things that when Boaz, if you remember, there was a law in Israel that when you were, uh, when you were uh, a pauper, you didn't have any land. There was a law in Israel that went, during the time of harvest, there was uh, to be left. You were not to harvest the whole field, but you were to leave the corners of the field alone for the pe poor people to be able to go in and gather wheat for themselves because they were poor, and that's, that was the way they could get food during the harvest. And so <clears throat> Ruth had learned that law, so she fell on the field of Boaz which is a type of Christ and you know every one of you every one of y'all going to be tested the same way she was tested uh, Ruth was tested by Naomi saying go back go back go on back I mean how many of y'all thought about leaving here if you hadn't you hadn't been here very long because you, you will be tested with that you'll get to thinking about leaving See, people get, let me tell you something, people get their own ideas in here. They get smart. They think, I know more than the ministry knows, and I've come up with my idea of serving God. But they don't know enough of the Bible to blow, you know, those ideas out of their mind. And they get convinced that they think that they're going to live for God outside of the body of Christ. Uh, let me tell you something, saints. I'm not preaching a, par a parroted message. I'm not poly parroting this message. I have searched every avenue that I can search in the Bible to determine whether or not this body knows what it's talking about. And I cannot defeat the d doctrine of this body. I've, I've tried it. I've wanted to leave here. And if you hadn't, you're lying or you ain't been here very long. The temptation's there. But you've got to get to a place that you've got enough of God and the Word of God in you that you know it's the truth, and you cannot get around it. You can't defeat it. 
I've searched it. It would, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just all do our best and go to heaven anyway? And just live, you know, just live your own ideology in your mind. Well, let me tell you something. God's more emphatic than that. God's more precise than that. It takes righteousness to reap eternal life. It takes righteousness. It don't take part of righteousness. Listen, there's good dogs and bad dogs. I raise them. Just because you're a good dog don't mean you're going. Make it. You know, my mother-in-law, she'd say, well, she said, I, I don't go to church, but I think if I do the best I can do, I'll make it. I'm sorry. Of course, when I talk like this, there's some people just turn me off immediately because they got their own ideology and they think they're smarter than I am about the Word of God and all the ministry in the body of Christ. But I'm just going to tell you they're not. I'm sorry about that. They're not. It's, it's self-made ideology to try to make up your mind what you think about God if you don't have enough Bible to back it up. If you're one of them people, I'd like for you to talk some. And let me ask you some questions. Because you'd have a hard time answering them and not getting tangled up in questions, biblical questions with biblical answers. So I'm not, I'm not Polly Parrot in the message. I, this message is in my heart because I know it's biblical. And I've tried. I've looked. I've searched. Are we, what we're wrong? What are we wrong about? <laughs> Just like this is what I'm talking to you today. I'm talking to you about making the bride at a specific time. And that's not taught in this whole body. And I can't accept that. And these scriptures I'm going to give you here today is why I can't accept it. I gave you one in Revelation 14, 13, that there's a specific time to die in the Lord. There's a specific time for harvest. There's a specific time here in the book of Ruth that there is... There is... Uh, that picture that here she goes back and she's, you know what, listen to the scripture. Don't you go in any other field. Don't you listen to your own ideology. Don't you think that somebody else has got this message outside of this body, outside of Christ and the Word of God. Don't you get to thinking that way. You stay in the field that God has brought you in and you reap here and don't you reap anywhere else. At three times it's told that in this little book. Three times. Naomi tells her that. Boaz tells her that twice. So <clears throat> it was the time of harvest. And it's a picture. Remember at the end of this story when, harvest, when the harvest, the wheat was brought into the thrashing floor and Boaz spent the night there. She went there that night and asked her to cover him. She wanted to marry him and get the inheritance of her husband, which he was their near kinsman. There was one other kinsman more near than Boaz. Y'all remember what that was? It represented the law of God. That's what Boaz said. There is a near kinsman nearer to you than I am, and I cannot perform the task of a near kinsman if he wants to do that. And so he met him at the gates among the elders and told the elders. And the elders, he said, yeah, I'll take her. So then Boaz said, well, there's one thing about taking her. She is, she is the widow of the son of Elimelech. That was the inheritance that she's to get. And you're going to have to provide that for her and raise up children after Elimelech. Elimelech represented the early church. The son represented the ministry that came out of that, Maclone. And that, that near kinsman was the law of God. And once he heard that, he said, I, I, don't, I can't do it. I'll lose my own inheritance. And that's why the law of God, it does have, it has rule over you. Now the law... The law manifests sin. That's what it is. The law makes sin sinful, more sinful. And so the law of God has rule over you. If you're not righteous and the law can judge you, it will, have to, it will take your 
near kinsmanship to you. But if the law can't find a place in you because you've overcome and made perfection, the law will lose its inheritance. It has no place if in a place like a perfect person. So it gave it up to Moaz, which is a type of Christ, and Christ married her, or Boaz married her. And that's a picture of the bride being made up during this harvest. It's harvest time. Remember that. I'm showing you a key in the Bible all the way through on harvest. How that it's in harvest time when the bride is made up. All right, let's go back. To, let's go to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 10 and 5. A couple little verses here. It says, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. There's another scripture, you know, that, that talks about the ant. Let me see if I... This, by the way, goes good for graduates. If you sleep in the summer, you know, in other words, you, he's talking about harvest. In the summer, when the harvest time is taking place, if you sleep during that time, you'll bring shame. But if you gather during the time of summer or during the time of harvest, you're wise. See, we're, we're living in a time, we are nearing a harvest. We're nearing harvest time. We're right now, we, it's, it's being planted, it's developing, and the harvest is near. The harvest of God is near. So, let me see if I've got that other verse in Proverbs. Is that in the 20th? 6-6, about the ant. 6-6, okay. Yes. So, let me go to 6-6. Six, six. Go to thy, the ant, thou slugger. This is in Proverbs 6, 6. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, ruleth, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. See, <clears throat> how long will thou sleep, O slugger? How long will thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. I use this a lot of times because listen to me saints did y'all know there is a sleeping spirit that gets a hold of people man of God goes to teach in the word of God and people gets dreary gets sleepy they can't listen they don't have much of an attention span and they don't know what's being taught that is a spirit of sleep slumber you gotta wake yourself you gotta wake <laughs> redeem Redeem, Paul said, while it's yet day, while it's time to be awake. I'm one of these guys, I never could take a nap in the daytime. I'm afraid something's going to happen. I'm going to miss it, Sister Tally. I, I'm, as I get older, <laughs> I've tried it a few times. Boy, it's hard for me to sleep in this daylight. I'm, in fact, I wake up some at night and I think, God, I wish it'd hurry up and sun come up. We can get started on things today. Do you do that, Sister <laughs> lay there at night and I can't sleep anyway so I just soon the sun come up so we can do something I go I sometimes get dressed at two or three o'clock in the morning go outside and walk around turn the outside porch light on say, let me see some light around here what could I do <laughs> just the way I am I'm sorry all right uh, Proverbs 20 and 4 it says, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. So you've got to get ready for the harvest. It's not during harvest time you get ready for it. You've got to work on it all year long, all the time. You've got to be working to get ready so I can be a part of the harvest. All right, I'm hurrying. Um... All right, now let's go to uh, let's go to Matthew thirteen and thirty. In fact, I'm going to need to back up here just a little bit. Twenty fourth verse where we'll start. This is the parable of the sower. 
It says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and the wheat went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, least while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest. I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. See, <clears throat> tares, I've said this before, tares are not chaff. Tares is a different plant altogether than wheat. Tares is those that have this ideology I was telling you about that, you know, they, they, they think differently. They got a religious spirit, but they don't have enough of the Word of God to hold to the truth. So they plant differently. They look like wheat. But if you try to deal with them during a time that it's not time to deal with them, you'll tear up wheat. You can tear up people trying to correct certain things in a church. You've got to be careful. That's why a lot of times y'all may think a pastor's got too much patience and he just puts up with a bunch of nonsense forever, it seems like. But he's fearful. He's fearful of affecting the people of God while he's trying to deal with people that are troubled. Remember, Jesus said, heresy must come, but woe be unto him by whom this heresy comes. you got to be careful about that. And so he goes on, though, and he goes down in the 36th verse. It says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him. Declare unto us the parable of the tares in the field. They heard his other parables, but they wanted to know about this one. They said, Tell us about this. He answered and said unto him, He that soweth good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels of the ministry. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. So, uh, the Son of Man shall send forth His angels, that's talking about His ministry, and they'll gather out of the, His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears, let him hear. So, <clears throat> uh, the harvest is in the end of the world. That's when God's gonna gonna make this separation. See, sometimes you may not even understand how ministers judge certain things and gather the tares up. Sometimes you just let a tear go until it gets to a place that uh, sometimes you, a tear will it'll die out on its own if you give it enough time. If you Sometimes you can work things around which causes a tear to die. You just, you know. Anyway, so I'm just showing you here in Matthew 13 that it the harvest is in the end of the world. Um, okay, now let's take, uh, well, let's look in Matthew 9:38. I think I left that one out. When Jesus said this in 37, Matthew 9, 37 and 38, it says, Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Uh, 
just remember this. He's talking to his disciples about the end of the Jewish world. So there's an end of two worlds. There was an end of the Jewish world. There's going to be an end of the, this Gentile world. And so these are scriptures apply, they apply both ways. Some of them are talking. The scripture I read you in Revelation 14 is definitely talking about the Gentile world, the end of the Gentile world, and the harvest of it. I'm reading you harvest scriptures. Jesus was dealing with his apostles in the end of the Jewish world. They apply to us. So just like Ruth definitely applies to the Gentile world. So I'm just showing you there's two worlds, two harvests. You've got to get that. There's two harvests takes place in two different worlds. Remember Brother Leninger was strong about teaching that. Okay. Um, I'm wanting the scripture in John. Yeah, it's in 4. We'll start in the 35th verse. Remember, Jesus was walking along with his disciples, and he said to them here in verse 35, he said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are ready to harvest. And he that reapeth, reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. When did they get that life eternal? is during the harvest. The harvest was coming in the end of the Jewish world. Now, notice what he said here. It's amazing. He says, don't say it's four months to harvest. You know, the wheat harvest was in Abib or April, so according to our calendar, if we uh, try to equate it to our calendar. So, January, February, March, April. So it was in January in the winter time. And what could you see in January that was the fields were ripe and ready to harvest? You can't see that in January. But Jesus saw it. He saw that the end of the Jewish world was upon them and that world was ripe and ready for a harvest to begin real soon. And so he was telling, don't say it's four months, which naturally it was four months, but it wasn't very long he saw that the harvest, he was going back to heaven, he was sending back the Holy Ghost, and the harvest was going to start. So let's go back to Revelations, the 14th chapter, right quick. Um, yeah, we'll go. We'll go uh, Revelations 14. I'm about done. Uh, okay, so here in the 15th verse, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice and said, said to him that sat on the throne, Thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest is of the earth is ripe, and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. That that's you know, you read all that in one verse, but it it's gonna take a minimum of fifteen years to harvest the earth, the harvest time in the end of the Gentile world. The harvest time in the end of the Jewish world was actually uh forty five years, not fifteen. It looks like the Lord's cut it down to 15 years. I'm still working on the 45-year period of the uh, of the Reformation. See, down here, the scriptures actually include the Reformation of 30 years uh, as being the 30 years and the 15 years being the restored church and the gathering of the harvest. Brother Leninger used to tell me, he said, Brother Smith, I used to say, how am I going to, how are we going to accomplish it all this in 15 years? I said, Brother Smith, Paul, he rode donkeys, he walked, and he took ships to go all to those Gentile works and plant all those works. He said, it's going to come a time that God's going to provide you with technology that you ain't even going to have to go to the Dominican Republic and wherever else God may send you. And, you know, right now I'm having Zoom meetings with them over there. Every week I have a Zoom meeting 
all these pastors and preachers gets on these Zoom meetings and I'm teaching them the Word of God. They can ask questions. We're recording it. And I'm sending them links to the recordings to the cloud, wherever that is. That ain't the one Jesus is coming back on, I can promise you. But he may use that cloud. Anyway, so he said, you're going to be able to do so much more, so much quicker than Paul was able to do. It ain't going to take you no 45 years. I said, all right, I trust you know what you're talking about. Well, it's coming to pass. Now, let's read down a little bit further here. Let's start in the 17th verse. said, Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, judgment, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle the cluster the uh, the, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it unto the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the cities, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. There, see, another type of, this is a harvest of the world. The harvest of the earth. Remember what I told you about the earth being religion? America got developed through the earth of religion. The earth, our God's people, is going to be harvested. But there will be another harvest, another gathering of the world of the ungodly that will be cast into the winepress of the wrath of God. And the blood will flow even to the horse's bridles. That's the battle of Armageddon taking place. And that's God's, he, he, that's God's final judgment. And if you want to, you can go to Joel. Let's go to Joel, the third chapter, and the 13th verse. And I'll finish right here. Joel said, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full and the fats overflow. For their wickedness is great, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, the stars will withdraw her to shining. The Lord also will roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and heavens of the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shalt thou know that I am the Lord thy God dwelling in Zion. Zion is the, the mountains of Jerusalem. My holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. There shall no strangers pass through her anymore. That's, you can just link that verse right there up with, with that scripture I showed you of the winepress of God's wrath in the book of Revelations 14 chapter that God is going to judge this world but first he's going to make up his bride in the very end of it those are scripture saints it's hard for me to get around and just saying that you can make the bride any time down through the dark ages there's a specific time that the Bible's pretty emphatic about and this ain't the only thing, but the book, the, this, this lesson on harvest is a very emphatic lesson, I believe. So I just wanted to give that to you all today. God bless your hearts. We'll take a break. Go upstairs. All right. Well, yeah, I... Uh...